at a later date. So, employee-owned firm offering air quality services since uh, 1979. We provide services in ambient air quality, monitoring, modeling, and permitting, which is the subject of this webinar. Uh, indoor air quality, occupational hygiene and safety, and uh, we also have our own calorie accredited laboratory in which we analyze many of the uh, samples that we take. We have a fair amount of um, uh, lab and monitoring instrument, and a fair amount of our work does come from permitting, so it's a big area that we've worked in for uh, a number of years. Um, and our clients are pretty diverse, governments, uh, manufacturing for permitting, and uh, we've also provided expert witness in the area of uh, air quality. Uh, before I go on to the uh, actual webinar itself, I, I should also mention that this is the first in a series of webinars and seminars that will be provided over the year between October and next June on various aspects of air quality. We'll be sending out um, notifications of those, so if you're interested in any of the other aspects of air quality, we'll also be providing those webinars. So. Uh, back to this particular webinar, we're going to go over um, what are emission permits, the different permit routes that uh, are available or that you are forced down, exemptions to permitting. The relatively new regulated easers actually came in at the beginning of 2017. The application process for both ECAs and air easers and requirements for air easers. And then we'll go into the technical details of the impact assessments required to support both ECA and air easer applications, both the impact assessments for noise and air. And then we'll finish up with the uh, issuance of the permits and uh, any other permitting matters. So <clears throat> basically a permit is a legal permission to emit contaminants into the environment in Ontario, and it's covered under Ontario jurisdictional law. It allows you to legally operate equipment and or processes, and uh, we'll look at definition of equipment as we go along, but the requirements are based in part on sections 6 and 14 of the Environmental Protection Act, which create prohibitions against the discharge of contaminants into the natural environment that cause adverse effects. And the requirement of a permit is that you demonstrate that you don't cause adverse effects. So what are contaminants? Contaminants are, and, and this is taken uh, from the definitions provided in the Environmental Protection Act, any solid, liquid, gas, odor, heat, sound, vibration, radiation, or combination of any of them resulting directly or indirectly from human activities that causes or may cause an adverse effect. So it's a very wide ranging. It includes uh, air emissions, both gaseous and solid, say as dusts or particulate matter, and also includes uh, sound and vibration. So of all of the contaminants in this list, the two most common are the air emissions and the noise emissions. Uh, the others are not dealt with uh, very commonly. So as I mentioned earlier, um, as a result of significant regulatory changes that occurred at the beginning of 2017 with the introduction of these new air easers, we now have a new and quite different permitting landscape in Ontario. And it, it breaks down basically in the way that I've shown on this flow chart, and I'm going to be repeating this flow chart at a few points through the uh, presentation, as this gives you sort of a, an overview roadmap of the permitting system that now exists in Ontario. So let's start off with the basic requirement for a permit, whether you need one or not. Section 9 of the Environmental Protection Act indicates that no person shall accept and in accordance with an environmental compliance approval, or ECA, use, operate, construct, alter, extend, or replace any plant, structure, equipment, apparatus, mechanism, or thing 
that may discharge or from which may be discharged a contaminant into any part of the natural environment other than water. And part B of that is has the um, um, the word alter in front, but basically the same word in. So if you alter any of the things mentioned in part A above, um, then um, you're required to have an approval of some sorts. Um, this is the Section 9 requirement for ECAs. It's very general in application. And elsewhere in the Environmental Protection Act, there's also there's different but similar requirements dictating the need for ESA permits. So there's kind of a parallel statement for uh, ESA permits there. Um, you'll note on this slide that I've underlined and bolded the word thing just to um, emphasize how general the application is, to literally applies to anything that can cause a discharge. And I've also underlined the words may in that um, you have to account for potential emissions or a possibility of discharging. So even the possibility triggers the requirement to have a, a permit. Um, generally, the things that need permitting are mechanical items and the most common would be exhaust stacks or exhaust vents for processes. That would be the first thing that comes to most people's mind. Um, but it not only includes that in terms of what requires permitting, it also uh, includes uh, fugitive emissions. Those are emissions that are not directly emitted through an identifiable stack or vent, but still need to be accounted for under the, uh, the regulations. So for example, certain mineral dusts uh, from handling uh, minerals or aggregate outdoors, or odorous emissions, for example, from waste lagoons or tailing ponds. Um, so although those particular types of processes may not be associated with a specific piece of venting equipment, they need to be considered as part of the uh, permitting process. Um, within the regulations, there are there is mention of activities that are specifically exempt from the requirements of permitting. These include activities such as routine maintenance, um, where you have clean air exhausts that are provided just for heat relief and there's no contaminants in the uh, air exhaust from, uh, say, a facility general, general ventilation fan. Then those, those are exempt. Small residences are exempt from permitting requirements, as are agricultural operations. Uh, a summary of all of the exemptions, or a fuller list of all of the exemptions, is actually provided in a regulation called Regulation uh, 524.98, and that lists all of the uh, regulations uh, under permitting. And in terms of what's sort of quote unquote new, or really um, some new exemptions that were introduced last year in 2017, um, there's additional activities that are now exempt, including wood fuel burning less than 50 kilowatts, schools, activities at schools, HVAC systems under certain conditions, and cooling towers under certain conditions, and standby power systems under certain conditions and meeting certain criteria can be exempt from permitting. However, um, the Ministry has made it clear recently that uh, even though a number of these activities or sources may be exempt from permitting, if they emit contaminants to the air which are common with permittable sources, sources which do require permitting, then those emissions need to be accounted for on a site-wide basis, regardless of whether the particular activities are permittable or not. So as a sort of a further example of what's not exempt, um, conversely, where you have general plant exhaust where the plant air has contaminants, um, as shown by the vent, the roof vents in the photograph here, or where you have openable doors and windows and, and the plant air has uh, contaminants within it, um, those need to be included in the assessment uh, for permitting. So basically, 
any man-made or man-influenced things that emit substances requires a permit unless specifically exempted. So, as, as mentioned earlier, as a result of major regulatory changes at the beginning of 2017 and the introduction of OREG 117, the requirement to submit assessments for air and noise emissions to the Ministry, or the, now called the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks, is now um, only restricted to environmental compliance approvals, and that only applies to some industries now, not all industries. Which industries ECAs only applies to now is designated largely by the NAICS code of the industry. So if your industry has a NAICS code which is uh, listed on the list shown in this particular slide, you're still subject to environmental compliance approvals or ECA requirements and need to submit your assessments to the Ministry of the Environment for review. If your facility has an AICS code which is not on this list, then more than likely you're subject to ESA uh, requirements under Ontario Regulation 117. And in that particular case, you're not required to submit your assessment reports to the Ministry for review. Um, and I'll go into those requirements a little bit later. So um, for those of you who have ECAs at the moment, um, but uh, or permits and your NAICS code does not fall on the list here, then you'll be required to apply for an air ESA whenever the next change occurs at your facility that, that would normally require an amendment to your ECA or by 2027, whichever of those two occurs earlier. So whenever you have a process change that requires an amendment to your ECA, or by 2027, you have to apply for an air ESA if your NAICS code, your facility NAICS code, does not fall on this list. You're basically subject to uh, ESAs under OREG 117. So, as I mentioned, um, the so called, uh, the, 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 there are a number of different routes now. And um, before I get into talking about ECAs and the new air ESAs, um, I'll, I'll take a little sideward uh, glance at the existing regulated easers which still exist in Ontario and where no full impact assessment is required. These so-called regulated easers now are only restricted to a few activities. Um, they're restricted to automotive refinishing, auto body shops, printing operation, and other types of uh, operation, uh, most of which don't really emit any significant uh, noise or air emissions. Uh, you, some of you who have been involved in this for a number of years may remember that um, HVAC systems and um, emergency generating sets used to be regulated under regulated easers. That's now been dispensed with and they're now exempt from permitting, as I mentioned earlier. So it's really just the two um, activities listed here, which uh, are the remnants of the regulated easers uh, under the old easer system. As I mentioned, um, for, for either of these activities, they're subject to certain requirements and conditions, and no assessment is required. I, I don't think any of the attendees of today's webinar fall under any of those uh, categories. But uh, if you do and you want some more information, I'd be happy to provide more if you uh, contact me after. So um, most permitting nowadays under the new system will actually fall under the Air Easer system. And if you'll have noticed on this flowchart, I've got arrows of differing thickness. Uh, in an attempt to try and show, roughly speaking, and not very quantitatively, but roughly speaking, the number of permits that will go through each route. So if you find that you need a permit, uh, only a very small minority will go through regulated easers. The vast majority will need either an ECA or an air easer. And depending on your NAICS code, you'll be pushed to the air easer or ECA. And the vast majority of permits, 
well, perhaps not the vast majority, but a majority of permits are likely going to go through the EARESA route with the minority going through the uh, ECA route. Um, and I mentioned earlier the main difference between EARESAs over ECAs is that EARESAs are authorized in-house, as it were, by a licensed engineering practitioner, which you have, you may have it either in-house or hire as an outside consultant, and the assessments are not submitted to the Ministry for review. And there's also a few other additional requirements for EARESAs, which I'll describe as we go through the uh, rest of the webinar. So in this next part of the presentation, I'm going to go through the work required to obtain ECAs and ESA permits and explain the assessment process that applies to both and try and point out some differences where there are some. So for, in, as a general statement, um, for both ECAs and EARESAs, a permit is issued if the emissions demonstrate compliance and it's based on the premise that pollution, either air or noise, can be managed by controlling at the source or using dilution or using both. In terms of the actual application process, um, I'll start by talking about ECAs, and ECAs have been around uh, since about 2011. The process requires that the uh, owner or operator needs to apply before constructing or altering anything. Um, there can be, if necessary, a pre-application consultation with the ministry if it's a particularly complex application or there are some outstanding issues or uh, questions that need to be asked. The application package is then submitted to the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks for their review and approval and upon application a summary of the project is posted to the Environmental Bill of Rights website, an EBR posting, for the period of approximately 30 days. And that allows the public to comment on the application and provide any information that they wish to provide. At the end of that process, a decision is made by the Ministry. Um, the decision can be appealed, although it's very rare to have an appeal of, uh, of a, de a decision. And then the uh, permit is issued. Generally, um, when an application package is submitted to the Ministry, as part of the review process, there's uh, often a fair bit of back and forth between the applicant or the consultant and the reviewer at the Ministry to go over technical questions or uh, answer any technical issues that might be raised by the, uh, the review. Comments are also sought by the Ministry from the local district office, local to the site for which the application is being made. Um, most ECA applications nowadays are of the flexible variety that allows changes to be made in-house, and these are called the uh, Limited Operational Flexibility, or LOF ECAs is the, the latest name for them. Um, they provide flexibility to make changes without having to go through a permissions process with the Ministry of the Environment. Um, you generally have to assess your emissions in-house and ensure that you're still meeting requirements in-house for any process changes. Um, but it, it makes the process of updating process changes at your site uh, quicker and provides more flexibility. As part of the new regulatory changes that came in last year, the MOE have committed to significantly speeding up the review process for ECAs. They have a one-year mandate, um, but it's still um, yet to be shown um, how well they're going to abide by that, since it's still relatively early days in the new regulatory regime. Going on to air easers now, by comparison, there is nothing like the interaction with government that you have with ECAs. Instead, registration just has to be made before the facility starts up for new facilities, or registration updating for process changes if there is a modification. Um, of course, as part of the design work for a new facility or facility or process modifications, 
air and noise assessments uh, of that new or modified process is required, and that only makes good design and planning sense, of course, to do that. So, in essence, with these air easers, the government places reliance and liability on the licensed engineering practitioner either conducting the work or signing off on the work to ensure it meets government requirements using appropriate methods. So I'm now going to go over the application packages that are required for ECAs and uh, air easers. For ECAs, um, those of you who've been through this process will probably be quite familiar with the fact that you need to include an application form, proof of legal entity, an air in, a report on the air impact assessments, a report or form for the noise impact assessments. Um, there are costs associated with the applications, which are a function of the type and number of sources that you have on site, site diagrams and other supporting information, such as uh, SDSs and zoning diagrams. So virtually all of this generated information is submitted to the Ministry for review. In the, in the case of AIRI easers, however, only some documents need to be submitted, and they are not generally reviewed by the Ministry unless part of a, a special audit. Um, so prior to registration, a person engaging in a prescribed activity has to have prepared uh, an, an EASA Emission Summary and Dispersion Modeling Report, or ESDM for short. This is essentially the Air Impact Assessment Report. There's also a requirement for an ESDM report supplement, supplement, a noise report, and an odour screening report. Um, and remember that these documents and assessments have to be updated before a new process is added or process modification implemented. Preferably, of course, as I mentioned before, this should be done during the design and planning process. These documents have also have to be reviewed and stamped by the LEP. And this is the new requirement specific to um, air easers. And in terms of what's actually submitted on the registration website, it's the air and noise impact summary tables and some administrative information that's actually submitted as part of the registration. If uh, applicable, there may also be some additional plans and statements that need to be prepared. And depending on what you have at your site, there might be the requirement for a combustion equipment statement, best management practices plan for fugitive dust, best management practices plan for odour, or an odour control report. So these are additional requirements that are required of an air ESA that you don't have for an ECA. So to give you uh, some idea of what's required in the uh, ESDM report supplement, it requires administrative and verification statements along with a description of the operational parameters used to prepare the uh, air emissions impact report. Uh, I won't go over this in great detail, but uh, again, I can provide slides um, if you wish to uh, look at some of these notes in more detail. And this slide provides an example of the, the types of statements that would be included in the ESDM supplement report, such as if needed, facility needs to operate with doors and windows closed, or if it's a paint spray booth, must operate with a spray spray rate less than 10 litres per hour, et cetera, et cetera. Those are the types of uh, statements that would be included in those reports. Um, there is also a requirement for all air easers to um, um, fill out an odour screening report, which requires provision of the NAICS code identifying odorous processes at the facility, and the um, odor screening report will assess whether um, sensitive receptors in the area around your facility, such as residences and so forth, are a sufficient distance away to not trigger more detailed odor assessment requirements. And the setback distances tend to vary between 100 and 500 meters. If um, those setback distances are not met, then the odour screening report may trigger the requirement for other reports, other odour control reports to be generated, an odour BMP, BP, and or an odour control report. Uh, those are things that may be triggered for your particular facility as part of AIRES. Um, for combustion equipment statements, 
Um, it's based on NOx emission intensity rate requirements for heaters and boilers greater than 10 million BTU per hour, which is quite a large gas-fired unit. Um, so if you have any very large gas-fired units on site, they might trigger the requirement for a combustion equipment statement. Um, electricity generation engines, those would be, for example, if you have uh, a diesel genset that use peak shaving, that would be an additional requirement for assessment for those. And if you had uh, wood-fired combustors, there are additional requirements for those. If the requirement for a dust BMPP is triggered, um, I've listed on here some of the requirements that need to be included in the report. I, I won't go through those in any great detail, but uh, if people have particular questions about those, I'm happy to answer them uh, afterwards. So having gone through some of the general application procedures and requirements for both ECAs and ESAs, I'm going to change tack slightly here and go into some of the technical impact assessment requirements methods required for both air and noise. And it, it's useful, uh, even if you do hire a consultant to do this work for you, that you as proponents have some understanding of the technical basis for this so that you can interact on a more efficient basis with the, uh, with the consultant if you have a, an outside consultant helping you. So for both air and noise, in very general terms, uh, impact assessments are based on computer models and or calculations. And it's the same type of impact assessments that are used for both ECAs and air easers. In general, a model is used that allows you to predict the dispersion or propagation of contaminants, whether those be air or noise, emitted from the source. And you have to use these calculation methods uh, to determine the worst case impacts. Um, in large part, it's based mostly on calculations and mostly not based on measuring noise or air quality at, uh, in the surrounding area. So just briefly going over the noise impact assessment requirements, there are various levels of impact assessment required depending largely on um, separation distances between your facility and noise sensitive receptors such as residences. So at the top level or top tier, as it were, if you're more than a kilometer from any noise receptors, then you'll pretty well screen out in nearly all cases and not need to do any further work. However, if you have noise receptors that are within a thousand meters, um, depending on the equipment that you have on site, you may have to go through um, noise screening assessments, which are, is a two-stage process involving a primary and secondary noise screening. Um, um, the basic procedure is that you go through a primary noise screening assessment procedure, which is a very conservative, simple uh, screening assessment, and if you pass that, then that, that's the uh, completion of your noise assessment and you just submit your primary noise screening assessment information. If you don't pass that screening assessment, then you're kicked into the secondary noise screening assessment method, which is more detailed, less conservative, um, and uh, is another way of uh, uh, attempting to show compliance with the noise standards. If neither primary nor secondary um, noise screening methods are applicable to you or you go through them and you don't screen out, then there may be the requirement for a full acoustic assessment, which requires uh, the quantification of noise emissions, the use of a noise propagation model to predict impacts, and the comparison of those maximal noise impacts against the ministry's default noise standards or site-specific background levels, which is whichever is the greater of the two. All of that assessment work that then gets um, summarized in an acoustic assessment report, or AAR, and uh, that gets uh, either submitted to the ministry for review if it's an ECA or is signed off by your LEP if it's an air user application. And um, in some cases, there may be a requirement for a measured noise audit uh, to ensure that the uh, acoustic assessment report is, uh, is valid. So just to give you an idea of the types of uh, default noise limits that the ministry uses, um, 
Um, if you, uh, uh, these are the types of noise limits that apply at noise receptors, and they vary dependent on the time of day and the type of acoustic environment that the noise receptors uh, exist in. Um, so, um, uh, class one area is an urban area with a constant urban hum in the background, such as a major city or town, city of Toronto, for example. A class two area is a suburban type area, and a class three area is a rural area. And you'll see that the uh, default noise limits given in one hour DBA limits generally get more stringent as you get into quieter areas. So um, the class three noise limits are more stringent than the class one limits because the idea is not to uh, raise noise levels uh, uh, appreciably above background levels. You'll also see in the table provided that they vary by time of day, where um, the noise levels become more stringent during the night time, which is defined as uh, uh, 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. in the morning, along the bottom row of the table there. So those limits are more stringent at night, not surprisingly, compared to daytime limits between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. I'll mention briefly that um, there has been, it's not really new anymore, but NPC 300 guidelines that have been introduced a few years ago now, and they introduce a new noise class, class four area, which has um, um, even higher noise limits, easier to abide by. And these are meant for areas intended for redevelopment into noise sensitive uses close to existing uh, industries and they, these are areas that are designated by your local municipalities so it's uh, important to be aware and in communication with your local municipality about uh, whether there are any class 4 areas uh, designated around your facility. Uh, air impact assessments generally follow the same general procedure as noise impact assessments. For air, air emissions you have to quantify the worst case emissions which can be either estimated or measured, uh, most often estimated. You use a dispersion model to predict the impacts, usually at or beyond your fence line, and you compare those maximum air quality impacts against the air standards. And that all gets reported in, a, in an air impact assessment report called an ESDM report. Um, I'll mention at this point that um, Regulation 419 uh, which was introduced in 2005, requires that all ESDMs um, are, uh, uh, are uh, written up and based on the new models and standards that will be phased in by the, or the last set of last set of phase-ins by 2020. So, if you have uh, an ECA um, which was modelled under the old OREG 346 method. Um, any of those facilities will be required to update their ESDM by 2020, by February of 2020. So it's not actually a lot of time left. So that's worth checking in terms of your uh, compliance and uh, assessment reports. The types of standards, air quality standards, are presented in this particular in, in this slide here, where, for example, if um, <clears throat> you emit uh, acid aldehyde then under the, uh, the new standards, which will be fully implemented by 2020, then the air quality limit is 500 micrograms per cubic meter. So if the emissions of acetaldehyde from your facility, if you emit acetaldehyde, uh, cause an impact of less than 500 micrograms per cubic meter, you're in compliance. If it's greater than 500 micrograms per cubic meter, uh, as shown in this table, then uh, it doesn't show compliance and, uh, well, you, you wouldn't actually submit a permit application stating that. You'd have to uh, do some further work to demonstrate that you could meet that compliance standard. And, and it's similar for a whole bunch of other uh, chemicals that are listed by the Ministry. The Ministry has uh, a list of about 120 substances for which they have standards, and they have guideline values for many more. Um, if you happen to emit substances which are not listed on the ministry lists for standards or guidelines, you have to go for a special process um, where you submit your assessed air quality level, 
to the Ministry for Toxicological Review, or if you're submit that's for an ECA, if you're submitting for an air ESA, you have to retain your own toxicologist to assess the predicted air quality level of the uh, contaminant emitted. So where is compliance measured? I've kind of touched upon this a couple of times in some of the previous slides, but just to summarize on this particular slide, for air emissions, if you're an industrial facility, it's generally um, the plant property line and beyond where compliance is measured, unless you have an on-site receptor, such as a tenant on-site. If you're the type of facility that's um, institutional type facility or a sensitive institutional type facility, such as a hospital or school, um, then on-site receptors might need to be accounted for as well as property line and beyond. If your facility is located in a multi-tenant building, then um, you have to assess the impacts also on your neighbor's air intakes or openable doors as well as the property line and beyond. And in those cases, there might be the requirement for a so-called same structure assessment. For noise and odor, it's a little different in that uh, assessments are made where sensitive receptors exist. So it might be some some distance away from your property boundary, whereas I said for air, it's generally at property line and beyond, unless you have some special circumstances um, that apply to you. I'll also mention at this point that um, we've had a, a, a lot of experience in same structure contamination and developed some specialized software that can make that assessment uh, a lot uh, a lot cheaper. And if uh, folks out there have that requirement for same structure assessment, then uh, welcome to contact me to get details on that. Um, in terms of the permits that are issued, if you've applied for an environmental compliance uh, approval, um, if you didn't follow, fall under that NAICS code list, um, which makes you ineligible for an air ESA, then the permit that's issued will identify the owner and location of your facility or process. It will describe the processes and equipment, and it will include terms and conditions, including performance specifications, maintenance requirements, record keeping, and complaints process. And it's very important not to just forget about the terms and conditions that are listed in the permit that's uh, issued to you, but to ensure that you meet those terms and conditions. Um, because um, the Ministry can conduct inspections and audit whether you are meeting those terms and conditions. And if you're not meeting those terms and conditions, then uh, they will issue warnings and uh, requirements to you. Um, the terms and conditions are especially important if you have a flexible ECA, which most of them are, as there are ongoing requirements to keep impact assessment reports up to date and there is also annual reporting requirements for flexible ECAs. Um, there's actually a, an error on this slide. I have to uh, apologize where it says at the top ECAs, it should say air easers. I'll, I'll correct that in the version that gets sent out. Um, for air easers, Simply speaking, once you've registered, confirmation is issued that you've registered, and that's essentially the end of the process as far as registration is concerned. But the documentation that's generated by your LEP will include performance specifications, maintenance requirements, record keeping, and so on, similar to an ECA, which again, you need to uh, document and keep that documentation as part of the conditions of registration. So that's essentially the um, end of the webinar. Um, I mentioned that um, if anybody has any questions, they're welcome to put the questions on the chat function, and uh, I'll attempt to answer them. So I'll, I'll stay online and pause here in case to give some time to people to think about questions and ask them, and, and I'll try to answer them. Or as I mentioned earlier, if you would prefer and you, you have specific questions and would prefer to email me those questions separately, I'm, I'm happy to deal with those again. And, and just a reminder that uh, the webinar will be recorded and the recording will be distributed to all as well as the, uh, as well as the slides. So I'm, I'm just going to pause.
for a bit and, and uh, give everybody a chance to ask any questions that they, that they wish to ask.